returns are, um, uh, you know, the chart for the moment when the sun returns to its natal position. Now, as you know, there are a couple of variables that we can introduce here. You can set that chart for the place of birth, or you can set that chart for wherever you may be at the time of the birthday, or a third option is where you spend most of your year. Maybe on your birthday you're going on vacation, but it's not a place where you normally live, so you might still want to set it for your normal place of residence. So those are really the three possibilities when solar returns are concerned. Now, again, this is something we talked about earlier, and this is something that, um, you know, astrologers always start breathing kind of heavily. Okay, so do we, uh, do we set the chart for the birthplace, or do we set it for your place of residence, or can you travel on your birthday and maybe to a location where your solar return looks rather better, and therefore you can hopefully change your luck. Now, I, I must admit, I, I am rather amused by the idea that, you know, if you just travel to some point in remote Siberia on your birthday, you're going to have a fantastic solar return, and um, all sorts of ills are going to be prevented for the year. I am not as big of a fan. I think of the three options. To me, that one seems the least effective, to be quite honest. And the reason is, and you'll see why that is, but I think one reason is that solar returns are really a snapshot of transits going on at your birthday. Those transits are going to be happening to your chart wherever you are on the planet. So just because you are essentially moving a house location of different planets around in the solar return doesn't necessarily change everything. Now, looking at the solar return as a standalone chart can be helpful, and we'll, we'll talk about that too. But uh, don't forget that probably the most important um, issue with solar returns, or the most important, the biggest value, is that it tells us, especially with the slower planets, or the, the heavier planets as they're known, which ones are going to be active for you that year. And I'll get into this a little bit later as well, but I want to broach this topic, right, so that wherever you are, whether you're in your birthplace or whether you're living far away from there, you can cast a chart for both. And when I do predictive work for myself and for my clients, I actually look at both charts. I'm living far away from where I was born, and so the two charts are actually always quite different looking, at least the location of the planets. Obviously, the aspects and, and transits to my natal chart are the same. But I highly recommend that you cast both because each of them will tell you something a little bit different, but they're all telling you the same story. So if I'm going to give you a, a visual, an image that I want you to hold for this webinar and for the concept of using solar returns, imagine that you are looking at a very beautiful and complicated um, multifaceted gem. And it's not something that's particularly regular, so depending on the way that you turn it, you'll see something somewhat different. It's still the same gem, it's still your life that you're looking at for the upcoming year, but depending on how you look at it and from what perspective, you will find that you will get a new piece of information that you can add to the total tapestry. Most of us, I think, um, coming out of a more modern approach to solar returns are taught that what you do is you cast the return, whether for you know, whatever location you find appropriate, and then you just look at it as a standalone chart. And that's completely, as I said, it's valid, but it's only one of the ways that you can use solar returns. Where I think people have a lot of frustration, and often I think they kind of give up on solar returns, is that's where they stop. And I, I think it's an approach that gives you some information, but I don't think it's necessarily the richest approach. So what's helpful is if you can stay with the solar return, use the different methods, and frankly even write down the information that you're getting and then you can see you're actually getting quite a rich um, diversity of views that are all united. You'll see certain themes repeating because, of course, the aspected planets and planets in the signs will be the same, but, of course, they'll be in different houses and they'll relate differently because of that. The main thing that I would impress upon you is that when we look at different methods of analyzing the solar returns, be aware that we're looking for repeating themes. So, for example, just as a very kind of obvious, uh, simple example, you can have, um, let's say that you're, if you just look at the standalone solar return cast for, let's say, your place of birth, you see, oh, this, this could be a good money year. But then if you change it for your actual um, place of residence, uh, maybe that influence seems to go away. So you should take note and see if any of the subsequent methods that we'll see, will which of those 
which of those predictions do they seem to confirm? I think with solar returns, it is, it is a little bit of a, of a majority vote kind of situation where if you're seeing the repeated testimony about something, that's when you start to give it weight. And that's why we don't panic too much when we see something seemingly terrible in our standalone solar return. There have to be a lot of other things in place to make something good or bad come true. Now, let me get to kind of a couple preliminary questions that I think are important and we should examine before we get into this. Uh, why should we predict at all? And this, obviously you signed up for this, this webinar, so you're probably interested in prediction, but it can be somewhat controversial, especially among modern astrologers or more psychological astrologers who want to distance themselves from events or event-based prediction. My approach is definitely event-based, and it's simply because that's what I personally am interested in, and it seems to be what my clients are interested in as well. The people who come to me usually want to know will I achieve this during this coming year, for example, or will this bad thing that I'm worried about happen? So their questions are very concrete and they are very event-based. I do recommend that when you approach a solar return, whether it's yours or someone else's, that before you even cast the chart, think about what specific questions are you trying to answer. It will help you deal with the overwhelming amount of information that sometimes arises and it will help you focus on a specific theme or themes and you'll know whether you'll be able to basically predict a little more accurately. What I think happens sometimes is that a lot of us open up our solar return and just to see where, you know, what's in there. But that can get very confusing and I think it's a disorganized way of approaching, again, a lot of information. But it's better if you kind of take a few minutes to reflect on what it is that you're really thinking about this year. You know, will so-and-so come true? Will I be successful in my project? What have you. The, the other thing that I want to make sure we talk about and that you should think about as well is whether it's possible for us to change the future. Right? It's, I encourage you to examine your beliefs. I think as modern post-enlightenment people, the answer for most of us would be yes. I think very few people will say no, everything is absolutely 100%. It's already been written and we're just living it out. But if you, you know, you might find that that is actually what you believe. Um, I think I am somewhere slightly on the predestination side of the spectrum, but I do believe that we have a lot of leeway. So for example, if we have a bad transit coming up, we may not be able to avoid some of its any of its significations, but we don't necessarily have to get the worst possible manifestation. Um, this is the idea, for example, as you see more in Eastern astrology where you propitiate certain planets. You see you're going to have Saturn, you know, very heavily uh, involved in your upcoming solar return. You might do some positive Saturnian things so that you hopefully can avert some of its more negative manifestations. It's a very basic uh, concept of remediation. My personal opinion is that our future is painted already in broad strokes, but we do fill in the details. So your chart wouldn't say, oh, you're destined to have this income for the rest of your life. It might say more generally, oh, you're, you know, you're going to be uh, moderately well off. You know, that's a big range and of course it'll be determined by where you live and your occupation and things like that. But within that you have a lot of play. And obviously the final reason I think is I wanted to emphasize is that we do have a good reason for predicting, right? And for thinking about at least what the stars seem to be showing us, the, the trends in our lives. Again, clients and ourselves, they want concrete advice and specific forecasts so they can make plans. I think that's the big value of astrology. It's not so that you're afraid of this bad transit that's coming your way in eight months, but it is a way that you can hopefully prepare now so that when it does happen, you are meeting it in a constructive and conscious manner and that you are thinking about uh, you know, good ways to bring that energy into your life rather than you know, maybe letting it wreak havoc. All right, so let's get on this. So here's my golden rule of predicting. The universe is mostly empty space, um, or really dark matter, but most of the time nothing happens. And this is one of the reasons why it's important to go into your solar return or lunar return or really any predictive method with some kind of concrete question that you want to answer. You know, will I get a better job this year or Will I meet somebody special this year or will my kids do well this year? Whatever, you, you know, whatever you're interested in at the moment. Because the truth is most of the time, most days, most weeks, and most years even, nothing too major happens to us. And this is, I think this is a good thing. Um, in general, obviously, you don't want your life to be a, a telenovela. 
um, because it's obviously a little bit too much. So be aware of that. Don't. I sometimes see astrologers, especially I have to say on the traditional side, where they every bad aspect that they see in the chart is just cause for doom and gloom. Well, you know the truth is, you only can die once, right? It's it's really most likely it won't be anything terrible. It might not be a fun year, but you have to make sure that you set expectations with respect to what your life is normally like and the fact that most likely it's not going to be anything too major. The other thing that I really try to teach, um, not just in solar returns but in general, is the importance of having a plan of attack when you have your, when you're looking at your um, charts. Because we are often looking at a, looking at a number, looking at a number of a number of different potential data, and I think it's overwhelming. I was recently talking to a friend of mine, and we we kind of just thought about what would it be like if all of our computers were finally, you know, were suddenly taken away from us, and we'd have to do all of our work by hand. I think it would be. I think it might, in some sense, it might make for a better astrology because we'd have to be much more selective about the charts we're looking at. We don't have to print off a stack of 20 different charts and then just kind of you know, look at it aghast, not really knowing where we start. So w with that in mind, I would suggest that here's the, a possible plan for prediction in general, and I'll, you know, tell you what we'll talk about this year, or I'm sorry, in this presentation. So obviously you have to start with natal analysis, and the reason this is bold is because we'll talk about that today. Of course you have to understand what the potential is, right? For most of us, you know, most of our lives, but we have a lot of possible potential. If somebody's asking about something really major, you'd have to see, well, is this promised in the natal chart, right? If someone's asking about wanting to get married, does that is that indicated in that natal chart? Because there is no point in predicting it if it's very unlikely. Now, again, I wouldn't necessarily tell a client, you know, don't bother dating, you'll never get married, it's a lost cause. But at the same time, you have to recognize that it, this person might have difficulty, right, that this is written for them in a way that they are going to experience challenges in attaining a relationship or getting it to, um, to stick. So knowing what you're working with, knowing the raw material that underlies whatever that solo return is, is essential. Highly recommended. Me personally, you know, then I, I go to the longer cycles, you know, secondary progressed or primary directed sign changes, which we're not talking about, but just want you to know that you know, that's something I do. And then we look at the more multi-year themes, right? So secondary progressions or primary directions that might be active now that might be in play for two or three years at a time. The thing that we will talk about today are annual and monthly perfections, which if you're not familiar with, um, you will learn a little bit about. If you are, we'll, you'll see how that works with solar returns. Then you would look at the solar return for this year and seeing how those two interrelate. And then if you uh, use lunar returns, which I do, though we won't have as much time for that today, I, I would set those as well. Now, just as a practical matter, um, since we're not talking about lunar returns, the only thing I would recommend is that if you do use them, um, you would just use the same house system and uh, place of references for your solar return, right? Even if you look at multiple sets of information, just make sure you're looking at it together as a set. So the other thing that I get asked about is, you know, what house system do I use? And you'll see that I use multiple house systems. Uh, when I use perfections and I analyze solar returns in conjunction with them, I use the whole sign system because it's the simplest. Although you don't have to. If you look at William Milley's work from the 1600s, um, Christian Astrology, Volume 3, which is the natal part of his work, uh, he actually did use perfections uh, degree by degree. So you could actually have two signs ruling one year, if you know what I'm talking about. If not, don't worry about it. But the point is that there are different ways of using perfections. They don't always have to be whole sign. Um, but I also look at planets, or, or excuse me, I also look at charts in a Placidus uh, house system. You don't have to use Placidus. You can use whatever you like. If you're whole sign only, this should all work just fine. If you're Placidus, if you prefer Regio Montanus, whatever you like, it's absolutely fine. The thing I would recommend is that you're consistent in your work, right? Is that you're always, you know, use that. And when you, especially when you're looking at kind of subsidiary charts like lunar returns compared with solar returns, obviously you need consistency. All right. So annual perfection. Um, annual perfections are very simple. I, I personally use the sign house or whole sign system to maintain sanity, and I use the traditional sign rulerships. And I'll explain to you why I do that. 
it's not so much that I'm, that everything must be traditional and we're ignoring everything else that's in the sky, but the reason is that especially with solar returns, um, signs, you know, planets in signs or planets moving in and out of signs and making aspects to each other are very important. So it's not that I ignore the outer planets. I use them mostly in the way that you use fixed stars. If they're conjunct something important, that's what I look at, and it's usually a bad thing anyway. Um, also, I don't like introducing three more malefics that, you know, than we need. But, uh, but the most important thing with this is that because these planets are usually so slow, um, they're going to be in the same sign for many, many years. And so some of that accuracy and some of that finesse that we want to get out of planets being in certain signs or changing signs, we lose that. So I, I tend to not prioritize them in this kind of work. The annual perfection is, uh, is quite simple. Imagine, if you will, your birth chart just in a, in a whole sign system. So if you have Aries rising, that'll be your first house, Taurus second, and so on. And you just count around. So the first house in, in that chart is going to be the first year of your life, from age zero to age one, and so on and so forth, around and around and around. Now, I see that some people make a big deal out of noting which house you are in this year and that that supposedly tells us something about the kind of year you're having. And I think that's moderately important, but in my own experience with my chart and that of many clients, um, as well as people's charts who have analyzed, you know, like celebrities and so on, it doesn't seem essential. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Because otherwise, we're all, when we're 30, we're all in our seventh house year. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a big relationship year for all of us. It is for some people, and it is sometimes, but if you think about it, um, make sure that you're aware um, that this is, it's just a small piece of information. I don't think it's the most essential, to be quite honest. Again, that's just because we're not all having the same issues at the same age. It, it seems sort of common sense to me. The thing that is key, though, and again, this is use traditional sign rulerships for this, is figure out the planet that's Lord of the Year, which means the planet that rules that sign. So again, using our example of somebody with Aries rising, let's again say that you're 30 years old and you're in your seventh house perfected year, you're going to be in a Libra rising, uh, or excuse me, a Libra perfected year. Now, which planet rules Libra? Of course, it's Venus. So there's going to be that, I've noticed, is actually very important. And this is something where you're starting to get your first piece of real information. What kind of a planet is Venus? Well, traditionally, it's a benefic planet, so generally, she's helpful. The amount of help, of course, depends on her condition in your natal chart and in, in the solar return. But here's something that is very important. What is Venus? What is her nature? Venus is a planet of love, of love, of love, love. She's of arts, pleasure, you know, all of these different things that, you know, we can, we can add to her. Her intrinsic nature, therefore, is going to influence your life in some way. So it doesn't just have to be a seventh house relationship kind of year for you, not at all, right? For example, you're an artist, having a Venus year could be very important for you in a career way, right? Uh, but, uh, but just think about, okay, what planet is, is your little temporary god, as it were, this year, right? or goddess. Think about that. Then you look at how it does, what it's doing in your natal chart, you know, which houses does it rule, where is it located, and the same thing in the solar return. Is it prominent? You know, is it on an angle, for example? Is it, um, is it uh, in a, you know, what house it's in, aspect it's making, and so on. Check what houses it rules, and then, and then her condition, right? Is she in a sign where she's happy in one of her domicile, for example? Or is she in detriment? What does that say? So make note of all of these things and you know, make, make little sort of guesses and see if you have, again, this repetition of themes as you go on to other methods. I think that the Lord of the Year and what's going on with it is very descriptive of the year and of who you are that year too. This is something that goes back all the way to, I would say, well, certainly to Jungian um, psychology and astrology where a human being isn't really static but we wear all these different masks, these different personas, which is a word that Jung coined, that you might wear for different parts of your life. You're one person at work, you're one person with family, one person with your astrology buddies, you know, what have you. So what, what the planet tells you is what mask are you wearing that particular year overall? 
or what overlay is there on the overlay overlay is there on these masks that you have. So again, if you're in a Venus year, you may be more interested in making yourself more attractive. You may, um, you know, you may find uh, you may have a mask that is more more genial and more friendly. Uh, you may want to reach out to people, experience art, you know, that kind of thing. So it doesn't hurt, and this is just my personal opinion. If you're whatever mask you're wearing or whatever planet is your Lord of the Year, try to seek out activities that are appropriate to that planet. It's a way of sort of flowing with the energy of the time, if you will, rather than trying to fight against it. If you're if you're in a Venus year, it's probably not a great year to try to do a lot of heavy Mars activity, whatever that may be, or Saturn activity. Right? Go with where the energy wants to take you and then mold it to the way that you want it to be. The other thing that I would recommend is in your perfected house, whatever that is, let's say it's the seventh to stay with our example, um, see if there are any natal planets in there, right? If you have any natal planets in the seventh, um, that might add a little bit of color. You know, let's say you're, you have, I don't know, Jupiter in the, in the seventh, there might be some jovial or Jupiterian influences in your life that year as well, although the ruler is going to be the much more powerful influence. Now, you can actually perfect any house or point, uh, but usually we start from the ascendant because that is the self. But uh, in traditional texts, sometimes you'll see the idea of perfecting the natal sun, and you just start counting from the natal sun sign, or perfecting the natal midheaven, you know, for career questions, things like that. I don't recommend it because after about perfected, you know, three points, you know, ascendant, midheaven, and sun, everything starts happening to everybody. So it's a little overwhelming. I think staying with the ascendant is key, and you'll see how that ties into solar returns as well. Are there any questions at this point? And of course, we'll do examples too. Yes, there are some questions. Mm -hmm. So for perfections, is your rising sign year zero and the second house year one? Is that how it works? Uh, yes, so, and, and it can be a little confusing, and you can actually get little charts for free on the internet, by the way, if you just go to Google right now and type in perfection chart, it'll be all counted out for you, <laughs> but uh, which will save you, you know, the, the older I get, the, the longer the, uh, you know, you have to go around, around, around the chart. So. The ascendant, um, exactly. So the first sign is your entire first year from, you know, when you come out of the womb to your first birthday with your little one candle on your little baby birthday cake, that's, the, that's going to be that first sign. So that whole year, if your Aries rising, would be, uh, would be Aries and Mars related for you. So then, so that would be one, and then two would be the, se the second house, three would be the third house? That's exactly right. Taurus, okay. yep. Because they were trying to figure out house 30 is house 7 and not sure exactly how that worked. <laughs> okay. Oh, I see. Uh, the other question is just perhaps a little bit more detail on what exactly a perfection is. Mm -hmm. Perfection just means advancement, quite literally. And so you're just counting around. So what it does, it's a way of getting a theme for the year. And I'll show you how it works with a solar return, but I want to make sure we're all starting at the same point. So you're simply looking at, okay, this year, you know, I'm going to be in my, let's say, Libra, you know, it's my seventh house year, then I'm going to be in my Scorpio year, you know, how it's a way of looking at the kinds of events and the kinds of energies that you are going to be immersed in for that year. Okay. And so when you have an empty perfected house, does that make any difference or are you just looking to the ruler of the house? You just look to the ruler. You can have a perfectly eventful year with an empty house. Okay, that seems to be, I think I caught all the it questions for there for now. All right. Well, obviously, more opportunities will, will come later. But hopefully, once you see it in action, it will give you a little bit more clarity. Okay. All right. So here is a sample chart, and I did this in a whole sign, but you don't have to. It's just easier, I think, when you're starting out with us. So here's what it, what it would look like. This is somebody we'll, we'll talk about um, whose identity uh, is going to be secret for now. And um, so this is someone born July 1834, and you can see how it works. Um, so at age 21, they were going to be in their, in, a, in their 10th house year. So 0, 1, and so on. I won't count around just because it's really tedious. But I wanted to just get you used to thinking about it and thinking about the ways that, um, you know, the way that your chart will look. So just as an example, 
one, two, three, you know, so your, your first birthday is here, your second birthday is here, third birthday, you know, fourth. So you can see that, for example, you know, in the year leading up to the fourth birthday, um, you're going to have Mars in Taurus, and it's going to be governed by Venus. So just think about, you know, the interplay of those. The, the Lord of the Year, or Lady of the Year in this case, is still Venus, and she's definitely in charge. But there is going to be a Mars in Taurus flavor to this as well, so be aware of that. You would also look at the fact that Venus is placed in the 8th house. So that might have something to do with it as well. You know, you can't ignore that either. Um, you know, the aspects that she makes might be relevant as well, and of course we'll talk about that, but this is just to give you kind of a sense of, you know, what, what it looks like. So monthly perfections are the same idea. You just walk forward one sign every month from the perfected first house. So let's say that you're, again, in your seventh house um, for the year. Um, if you want to know how each month is going to look now, and we won't spend too much time with this, but I, w I wanted to um, just make you aware of it, you'll start counting from the, from the seventh house for each month of the upcoming year. So then the seventh house is the first month following your birthday, the eighth house is the following month, you know, at the second month following your birthday, and so on, round and round and round. So it can tell us something about the month ahead. Um, it is thought that m the month with the Lord of the Year or Lady of the Year in it will be especially important or eventful. I found that not to be super accurate, so don't get overly attached to it, but it's just an idea that's out there. And as well, the months that are ruled by the ruler or Lord of the Year, and I think that's a little bit more common that I've seen. And so just in general, remember that the condition of the Lord or Lady of the Year natally and in the solar return will tell us about the quality of the event, all right? You might be having a Venus kind of year, but is she in a sign she's traditionally a problematic in? Is she in Aries, for example? Does that mean that the Venus uh, stuff that you'll experience will have a martial quality? It won't be fully Venusian that the way that you might be led to believe. And of course, remember our golden rule. Most of the time, nothing happens. So if you see something, oh my gosh, my, you know, my year is ruled by Venus and Aries, I'm doomed. Most of the time, nothing happens, all right? So here's how things work with the solar return. So when you have your solar return, once you've identified your uh, ruler of the year, you look at the Lord of the Year's location, um, as well as its condition in the solar return. Now, like I said, you can cast the solar return for both locations. You can cast it for the natal as well as your current residence and see if there are any similarities. Is there a theme emerging, for example? You know, make note of both and then see which one seems to be more heavily emphasized over time. So, for example, you'd say, oh, well, I see that the ruler of the year this year is in the 10th house, so that might have some 10th house significations around career, status, the mother in, in traditional thought. Um, as well as look at, you know, accident, accidental and essential dignity. You look at what sign it's in, you know, is it a sign where it's traditionally happy or unhappy or meh, you know, peregrine, <laughs> or is it accident, you know, is it combust, for example? Um, does it have, you know, does it make any aspects? In other words, what's happening just this one planet? I think this makes the solar return much more manageable because it gives you an entry point of a single planet rather than looking at a huge collection of aspects and placements and you're just like, oh my goodness, what do I make of this? This really gives you, I would say, a much more laser-focused entry into that chart, which I think is very important when we don't want to get overwhelmed. So you've done that and you have a sense, okay, maybe it's going to be a lot of 10th house issues, but maybe they're Venusian because let's say Venus is the lady of the year, but if she's in Aries, so maybe it's going to be um, about asserting, you know, one sort of Venus nature, but in a public sphere, you know, that kind of thing. So then you look at, when now we start looking at the whole chart, we take a deep breath, and we look at the, the ascendant sign and see what that rules in the natal chart. So let's say that we have this hypothetical solar return, and I guess it would have um, Cancer rising, let's just say. Um, and let's say, again, as an example, that Cancer rules the fourth house in our natal chart. So it's going to bring in some fourth house significations um, into that year as well. Again, there that may be the only fourth house signification you'll find in your analysis, but again, it might start getting repeated and you start paying more attention. So you just make a note of it and move on. And that's the thing. No one testimony will tell you 
anything definitively. They're all suggestions that it's really a cumulative uh, testimony of, of majority, right? Now, then we look at any dominant configurations in the solar return, and this is something that I think we don't get really in any literature, modern or traditional, but I've just found in my practice over and over that it's really important. The first thing you do in a solar return, um, you know, forget that Sun square Pluto in the, you know, between the sixth and ninth houses or whatever, just look at what is on the solar return angles. And when I say angles, really I just mean primarily ascendant and midheaven. To some extent, fourth and seventh can be important, but I think they're usually a little bit less evident. So, and when I say on angles, within, I don't know, within 10 degrees, let's say, of each on either side, you know, and that's important. And again, you can look at it for both locations. You'll see, oh, well, Venus in Aries is smack on the midheaven in one location, um, and then she's drifted off somewhere to the, you know, sixth house in the other. Again, you make a note of that, you know, the one place where she's emphasizing the 10th house, you'll see, okay, let's see if that seems to bear out in other analyses. We also check which of those planets, if any, are doing the same thing but with your natal angles. So you can see, okay, is anything transiting, essentially, your ascendant or midheaven, right, around your birthday? Um, it can be, you know, even the moon can be important if she's making important aspects. But really, are any of those planets, and again, these are going to be just the visible planets because, again, you could have Pluto on your MC forever and ever uh, for all of your solar returns for a long time. Are any of the planets from Moon to Saturn on your natal angles as well? The next thing we look at are any close major aspects that may not be on the angles. So again, close, I would say definitely within just you know five degrees, let's say. You can make it more if you like, but I, I recommend being fairly strict on this, otherwise everything's a major aspect. Um, and again, major aspects for me are the traditional or Ptolemaic aspects. So your, um, you know, your conjunction, trine, sextile, opposition, and square, and that's it. Don't get too caught up in the sesquiquadrates and whatnot. Otherwise, everything, everything becomes important. Um, and you can see, and again, you know, planets that are in major aspects are going to be in major aspects regardless of your location. Right? So let's say, just as a hypothetical, let's say that this Venus in Aries that's on the MC in a particular location is also trine Mars. Now that's going to be true no matter where you go. But you'll have to see, okay, where is that planet located and what house? Is that planet doing anything in my natal chart, right? Is that planet on, a, on my natal MC or something like that? So again, you start looking at connections. And the more connections you see, the more likely that's going to turn into a, an important event that year. And then again, finally, as I already alluded to, any solar return planets that are conjunct your natal planets or angles are likely to be important. Very often you will find Mercury and Venus conjunct um, either the Sun or their own natal places. I find that not to be super uh, indicative of anything because these planets are always moving around the Sun. The Sun, of course, is back to its natal location for the solar return. There's a pretty good chance they're going to be uh, close to their natal position. Take a note of it. Don't make too big deal out of it. Um, you know, just because you're having a seeming Venus return um, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to turn into an event unless there are some other supporting aspects. Now here's the big one, and here is the, the secret of practice that I'm about to share with you, is that are there planets changing dignity? This is something I never see mentioned in any text, and but it's so reliable. Or do we have any planets that are within, let's say, you know, three degrees of changing signs? And by, and by doing so, are they gaining or losing dignity? Here's one example for those of you who might not know what I mean. Let's say that you have Venus in Aries at 29. So she's about to move into Taurus. Now, as I said, Venus in Aries is in a place of detriment. She's not very happy or very strong in that location. Um, but she's about to move into her own sign of Taurus. Now, that can tell us something, I think, very important, that whatever Venus governs in your solar return and in your natal chart, can mean it's about to undergo a great improvement. So again, she has to be, it is more powerful when this planet is angular, either natally or in the solar return. If she's again just floating around in some house somewhere, it's, it's less of a concern. But I have noticed also that people who are undergoing big, big changes in their lives, you know, like they're changing long-held jobs or, or getting in and out of major relationships, you will often have at least a couple planets doing this. Um, you know, you'll have a couple planets about to enter a new sign 
or when they're starting something new, a couple planets that have just recently entered their new sign and have uh, gained or lost dignity by doing so. All right, so I'll take a moment here. There might be questions because this is somewhat technical stuff. Always helps to turn on the mic. <laughs> uh, the, there is one question here when you're talking about the solar return ascendant and its location in the natal chart. Do, mm -hmm. you, do you look specifically, like if it's conjunct perhaps a, a south node, would you, what kind of orb would you use and would that then also flavor the whole chart, like we look at natal charts having a, a planet conjunct, but in the comparison like that? So are you asking specifically about the south nodes? Well, effect, I'm, I'm using that as an example, planet? as an example, yes. Um, okay. No, I get it, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's very powerful, in fact. And you know, the reason it's powerful is because the ascendant is so ephemeral, it changes so quickly. So in general, the rule in astrology is that the more ephemeral something is, and if it's hitting something in your natal chart in this context, the more powerful. It's because that ascendant's only going to be there for you know a few moments, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say that, um, yeah, let's say that it's, I don't know, 17 Cancer rising or something like that, and let's say that you have your natal Venus at 19 Cancer. Um, then definitely, I think that is, it's very important, and I think the natal Venus and her kinds of Venusian energies and where she is in your natal chart are going to be very important, absolutely. Do you treat points like the nodes as equivalent to planets? And I think they have to be activated by a planet by conjunction in order for them to really do anything. Okay. Um, so when you talk about having a planet either just leaving a sign or just entering a sign, um, well, either way, it's going to be leaving and entering <laughs> uh, right, the, in right. the solar return. Do you use what kind of a timing method would you use for that? I usually I usually just use degrees, and so even if it's the moon and it's about to change signs, obviously that'll be in a few hours. Mm -hmm. If it's Saturn and and you know he's he's three degrees away, that might be you know a week or two or however long. So, and that's okay. I usually just check, you know, how many degrees away it is, and three seems to be about the right boundary. Okay. So you're using actual ast astronomical time for them changing, not a symbolic time? The longitude, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Right. The fact that that planet may change in two hours or three months or whatever it is is, is not as relevant. If you're working with someone who doesn't have a birth time, do you, do you mm -hmm. still, are you still able to do a solar return? And, and if you do, do you use it by putting the sun as being the ascendant, or how would you work with that? Well, that's really interesting. You know, I don't, um, if somebody came to me and they didn't have their birth time, and we wanted to do a solar return, I'm pretty conservative. I wouldn't necessarily create a new chart for them out of whole cloth, even if it's, you know, sun on the ascendant or what have you. Normally, I would just see, okay, what are the transits going on on their birthday? So we're, we're going to hit at least something major, if something major is happening to them that year. Okay. The an other, Another question, if a planet is about to change sign, and you said that the changes would be reflected in the house ruled by that planet in your natal chart, are those changes mm -hmm. then, if it's changing sign, what about if it's changing house in the solar return chart? Do you also check for that? or Not so much. It's interesting, but not so much. Yeah, I haven't found that to be as accurate. And again, you know, in this case, obviously, I, I fully encourage you to run two solar returns, you know, if, mm -hmm. if you live in a different place than you were born. Um, obviously, the change of the house is what will, will be different, right? It may, may not be happening in both charts. Um, now, that doesn't seem quite as, um, quite as indicative. Okay. What about the house being ruled in the solar return by that planet? Yeah, you know, I think you, I mean, you can certainly, see, this is where we get into the theme thing, right? You can see, okay, 
So this is, it rules the 10th house in one chart, it rules the 5th house in the other. So you just, you make a note of that. I mean, literally, you have you write it down because obviously you're getting a lot of information at this point. And you see, oh, do I have other 10th house indications? You know, is this repeating a theme from before? So you don't have to choose, you just have to see, okay, where is the, where's the predominant, um, uh, uh, you know, opinion here? Okay. Now, in choosing a, a Lord of the Year, uh, you you were using that idea of perfection, but what if you didn't use perfection? Would the Lord of the Year then be the um, no. ruler of the sign on the ascendant no. of the? No, I think perfections are the price of um, admission. I think you okay. need the Lord of the Year for that. Okay. All right. Shall we move on? So, yep. I think we've okay. got. Very good. Yeah. Yes, it looks right, like I'm glad everybody's so engaged, by the way. This is really good. So the person, again, this is just our example chart, this person um, who who's having their solar return in 1855. Um, I wanted to just introduce you to the idea of identifying the Lord of the Year. So their solar re this is their solar return chart, by the way. And their Lord of the Year for that year is, um, is going to be Mars. Now, Again, this is the solar return. So how is Mars in this chart? You don't have to type it in necessarily, but I want you to pay attention. So Mars has just changed signs. You'll notice that. Um, and if you look around, there's actually planets changing signs all over the place. But particularly, Mars has changed signs. And for those of you who are familiar with essential dignities, has he gained or lost in dignity? Take a moment, right? How is Mars in Cancer? Well. If you're, if you're in the know, uh, Mars in Cancer is in the sign of his fall. It's considered a, a challenging placement for Mars, or at least it's not a place where Mars can best express his essential Marsy nature in a constructive manner. So he has just moved from Gemini, where he's mostly peregrine or maybe has some minor dignity, um, into a fairly difficult um, placement for him, right? So that's something that may be a piece of uh, information or evidence that tells us, okay, Whatever Mars rules, and remember that Mars rules that person's perfected year, right? So it tells us something about, you know, it's going to color probably a lot of their pers that person's experiences. It might be a challenging year on at least one front. It doesn't mean everything will be a complete disaster, not necessarily. But it's just something that, okay, there is some change afoot that's, you know, you'll have to make an adjustment to potentially um, challenging new conditions. However, it's not all bad, which is interesting, right? And why isn't it all bad? Because this same Mars in that solar return has a very nice aspect, if you can identify that. He makes a very nice trine, an exact trine, to Jupiter, who's in his own sign of Pisces um, in the first house, not, not on the ascendant, but in the first sign. So having that trine there tells us that something difficult might happen, but that maybe our, our person is going to either get something useful out of it or, it's go or it may be prevented, possibly. Um, of course, we don't know enough to say at this point. But you can see that there is something very uh, challenging being asked this year. However, there is some really good luck or something very beneficial coming out of all of this. So I call this the case of Edgar Degas' mother. Now, Edgar Degas, as, you're, as some of you may be familiar, was a French painter um, from the 19th century, and so it's his chart that we were looking at, and then we'll, we'll go through. He, um, he said, art is not what you can see, but what you can make others see. In other words, it's all about the communication of certain feelings or thoughts, and here he is looking very emo. Um, and this is, in case you're not familiar, this is one of his more famous works. He's very well known for his paintings of, of ballerinas and um, you know, his, his impressionistic uh, talent. So here is his natal chart once again, and this one doesn't have the outer planets just because we don't really need them for this. I just want to, um, I just want you to be a little bit acquainted with kind of, you know, the kind of person we're dealing with, right? In general, um, you can see, you know, he's a Cancer Sun with a Capricorn Moon and with Aquarius rising. Because he's an artist, the fifth house will be important. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't know that when he was an infant, but we have the benefit of hindsight. 
and he has both uh, Jupiter and the North Node in there, which I think is very positive for certainly his interest in art, which doesn't necessarily mean he'll be great at it, but he'll certainly be motivated to work at it. And that Jupiter makes a very nice trine to an exalted Saturn in the ninth. All right, so we'll we'll talk about his chart um, in in a very specific way. So when Edgar, um, so Edgar Degas, his mother, I want to talk about his mother specifically. So traditionally, mother, the mother is the tenth house, and um, she is the ruler. You know, it's going to be everything the tenth. So Mars, how is Mars's uh, condition in this chart? And you don't have to answer. We don't have a ton of time, but I just wanted you to think about that. Mars is, it is angular. That is in an angular fourth house, uh, but he's not in a sign where he's normally happy. Mars is in the sign of his detriment, which is opposite his domicile of Scorpio. So there, that is one, I would say, small piece of evidence. There might be some issues around mom. We don't know if they're emotional, practical, something is wrong or going on with her that's, that's negative. We can't say it, but it's, it's a possible piece of evidence. Now, we can see, are there planets that might be causing Mars some problems? And which houses do they rule? So again, we can look at um, you know, what, what issues might be going on. I think that the closest aspect here that's possibly challenging is Mercury. Mercury makes a square to Mars. Now, Mercury, as you'll notice, if we want to see the source of potential problems, is in the seventh. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit hard to tell what that means for Edgar exactly. But it rules the fifth and it rules the eighth. The eighth, as you know, is considered a malefic house. It's, it's associated with death. The other thing about the fifth house is it's the eighth from the tenth, so it's the mother's death as well, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So Mercury here rules actually the houses of death, um, both the fifth and the eighth. It's a it's a, not a good planet in this chart, at least in context of, of the mother. The moon and Venus also rule mothers in general, so obviously we, you know, they're a nice piece of kind of secondary evidence, and interestingly, they're both not in great shape in his chart either. Venus is in Virgo in the sign of her um, in the sign of her fall, and she's in that unpleasant eighth house ruled by this somewhat unpleasant Mercury, and the Moon is in the twelfth, which is also considered challenging, um, and it's in Capricorn, right, which is which is the um, the sign of detriment for the Moon. So we're starting to get a theme. Okay, something's not good about the mom potentially with eighth house issues, not necessarily. The 12th house also rules um, the chronic um, chronic disease um, as well. And then, you know, we also have, of course, um, problems around fixed stars. Mars is within about three degrees of um, Algol, which, as you might be familiar with, is considered a most malefic fixed star. It's the, it's the head of the Medusa um, in the heavens. And so it can be associated with, um, you know, with things like um, death or destruction. Um, but it's also associated with great beauty. And um, as far as we know, Edgar Degas' mother was very interested in art. And so even though she was not a professional artist, she certainly had um, you know, that kind of interest and love of art that she encouraged in her son. So I just wanted you to kind of get a feel for what a natal analysis might be like. And again, remember, we were just doing one piece of his life here, right? Because when you enter that solar return, you're going to be entering, hopefully, with you know one main question about the year. So Willie Lilly tells us something about the health of the mother in his in his Christian astrology. He says when Saturn or Mars afflict the moon by square or opposition, and when they are also slow in motion and removed from the angles, it shows a sickly mother. Um, and the moon, when it's occidental and afflicted by Saturn, declares many diseases. So you can see that the moon. Um, does make a square to Saturn, in fact. It makes a trine to Mars, which is not great, but it's, uh, it's certainly the, the, the square to Saturn is, is particularly problematic. So we do worry about her health, and it was not good. Um, I forget what she had. I want to say it was um, tuberculosis, but she suffered from, you know, the point was that she suffered from chronic disease, I think most of Edgar Degas' uh, childhood. So here's what happens when he's 13 years old in 1847. He is in his second natal perfection, perfected house. So, you know, the the common wisdom would be, well, so it'll be issues around security, possessions, you know. It's not very descriptive, right? He's 13, I, you know, he's probably not really thinking about money a lot at this point. 
and it's important. That way you don't worry if you're in your eighth house per perfected. This is misspelled. It should be perfected house year. So you're not, um, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to die or anything like that. What I think is more important that, let me go back. If we go back to the second house, here's the second house. What planet rules the second house? It's Jupiter. And where's Jupiter? It's in the fifth. Remember, again, the eighth from the tenth. So if we were thinking, you know, is, is this going to be the, how is his mom's health this year? Well, we can see that Jupiter is going to be indeed uh, in charge, and he is in this, I think, potentially dangerous house for Edgar's mother. So it could be a time of creativity because, of course, Jupiter is in the fifth, um, and it may well have been. He was 13. We don't really know what he was working on at the time, although we know that he was already very interested in art, so he probably was doing art but it's just not really recorded. The problem is that given all of those difficult natal potentials around the mother, you know, that the early death of the mother is a potential for Degas, right? It doesn't mean that it would be the case for everyone else, but for him, given the afflictions, it's a real possibility. And now the other thing that I noticed is that that second house, since he's in a perfected second house, is square to Jupiter by sign. And that, that can mean that Jupiter will be expressed in a problematic way that year. Um, if it was Jupiter's other sign, if, you know, let's say we're, we're somewhere here, it's opposite that's also potentially challenging, right? So Jupiter, when he's squaring his own house as here, can mean that it's going to be a challenging year in some way. The other thing that is something I want you to be aware of, this is important for perfections and solar returns, is that in 1847, that year, Saturn in Pisces is transiting through that perfected ascendant in Pisces. So in other words, let's say that it's your perfected second house here, you check if there are any of the major planets, you know, basically Mars, but especially Jupiter and Saturn, if they'll be passing through that sign that year. Also, supposedly making aspects, I haven't found that as powerful, but you can see it here, but Saturn is actually transiting Pisces. So that can be another indication, something heavy is about to happen to Edgar, and you can see it here you know, transiting Saturn is, is right here. So this is before we even looked at a solar return, by the way, right? But I just want to kind of set the stage and make you aware of it. You'll also notice that um, one thing that's really challenging is that this, um, this natal Jupiter squares its Venus in the eighth, by the way. I just want you to be aware of that. And then Saturn is, by sign at least, opposing Venus, squaring Jupiter. You know, it's just a lot of heavy contacts going on. So I want to take a short moment to talk about Jupiter a little bit as a side note. And I want to just tell you about how these two seemingly unrelated areas of life, namely his mother's death and art, can be linked for an individual. So obviously the natal fifth house for everyone rules the death of the mother, um, eighth from the tenth, but of course also creativity and art, and this is true for everybody. Now with Jupiter in detriment in the natal fifth, I think it is possible to hypothesize that Edgar Degas' mother, mother's death was linked to his art in some way. Obviously, this isn't true for everyone. Just because you have a planet in the fifth doesn't mean that, you know, your mother passing away untimely means that you're going to be a great artist. However, if you maybe happen to be an artist whose mother died uh, when you were young, and if that planet is a benefit, like Jupiter, even though he's in Gemini, where he's not considered super strong, it may mean that Jupiter, you know, in Gemini, in the, in the sign of detriment, is something that brings suffering, but also brings you the potential to make something good out of it. So just something to, um, to consider. So a perfected year that's ruled by Jupiter might trigger one or both of these. It could trigger, and it did later on in his life, um, it could trigger a period of great artistic development and success. But early on when he was small, where he was clearly not yet a full flow, you know, fully fledged artist, Jupiter indicated that, you know, it had that negative indication, right? He wasn't yet, you know, doing anything really, you know, he wasn't remediating it. I'm not suggesting that remediation would have helped, but it certainly, you know, it, whatever was going to happen, happened and it unfolded in a particularly tragic manner for him. So in the future, it unfolded in a much more positive way. It had to do with his art and success and again his, his ability to develop this fairly, at the time, quite unique style of art. 
So these are monthly perfections, and I, I don't want to spend too much time on them because they're not our main focus. But um, I'll, I think I'll just skip over to the solar return since we have about 25 minutes left. So here's the solar return for that year. So if you'll remember, uh, Mars in Taurus rules his, uh, rules his year. Now, how is Mars in this chart? It's in its own sign, which is good. Um, but it's in the 12th sign, which is not so great, right? The other thing that's concerning, and I think I have some questions here so you can, a little more guidance. I want to ask you this. What natal house is rising? And we can go back to his, um, we can go back to his natal chart. Let me see here. So with, um, with Taurus, it's the fourth, right? So this is the fourth. So he has the fourth house rising. So something to do with possibly with the home and family. We'll see if there's a return of that theme. How is Jupiter doing? We obviously care about Jupiter because he is, um, you know, he is particularly important. And I'm sorry, the Lord of the Year actually should be um, Jupiter, not Mars. I apologize for that. Jupiter is in Cancer, which might be quite auspicious normally, right? And it's just moved into it. But let's see. As you can see, Jupiter, this is the same Jupiter that is in Gemini and that's in can that is in Cancer in the sixth house, which is not, you know, there are some issues. Even though it's exalted, there are problems. Here's the thing that's mo most important to me, though. What is happening to Venus and the Moon just in this chart without even referring to, to the natal chart? Bo they are both um, afflicted. Venus is exactly opposed by Saturn and the Moon is exactly opposed by Mars. And that, that's, right, that is telling us something. Now, that might happen all the time in a solar return. doesn't necessarily mean something tragic. However, in this case, given that natal chart, that is problematic. And given that both of these are ruled, um, you know, they both rule the mother. Now, what about planets that are strongly angular? There's really nothing on the angles here. Remember, that's the ascendant and the MC in this case. Um, we don't have anything super powerful. The closest we can say is that the sun would be on the IC, which would be at 19 Cancer, right? The fourth house can be important, by the way. Um, we, have, we have two indications now, right? We have the fourth natal here, and we have the sun on the IC. The fourth house can be a house of death um, as a secondary indication. It's associated with a grave and things ending. So it could be, you know, again, we, we make a mental note of that if we were to see that in a chart. So this one, this is just the inside chart is the natal and the outside is the solar, solar return. So the Lord of the Year here is, um, is Jupiter in Cancer. Now, he is in the natal sixth. So even though he may be beneficial in some ways as being you know, a benefic planet, when he's placed in the sixth, he can't do a whole lot. Um, and it's the, it is the solar return third. Again, not really doing a whole lot there because they're cadent houses. So the, the expression of those planets there is is thought to be a little bit stymied. Now, how is the moon? Right, the moon falls in the natal ninth house, again, kidned, and the solar return sixth. So you can start seeing there is a sixth house emphasis here. And then on top of that, the moon, of course, closely opposes that Mars and Aries. So this could be a difficult year health-wise for him, or as it turns out, for his mother. But you're starting to see a theme. The moon also is associated with the body, by the way. So any aspects to it, for example, you know, opposite Mars can be challenging for the body. Venus, you can see, is near her natal position in the eighth. I don't think that's super important, but it is highlighted by the fact that it is opposed by Saturn and the solar return. And remember, this is the same Saturn that's actually passing through that perfected ascendant this year, right? The MC, um, which is in the natal twelfth house. Um, it's not, that's not great either. And remember, the MC is the mother, right? Um, and it's interesting. It's actually conjunct the natal moon. So the solar return midheaven is right on the natal moon. That is important. Somebody asked earlier what happens if you have the solar return ascendant on a natal angle or a natal, natal planet. This is similar. You have a solar return MC on a natal planet. And it's particularly an afflicted natal planet, right? So that's a challenge. And then finally, the solar return ascendant is here, 
within spitting distance of the natal Mars, which, as I said, could be potentially challenging. So there are just so many themes. This is not like, oh, you look at this and you might miss it, right? There are so many themes of difficulty. And these, this is all just standard analysis, right? This is stuff that you would normally notice if you were to go into the solar return because you see, wow, Mars is activated, this difficult moon is activated, you know, again, we have this moon-Mars opposition, you know, kind of repeating the theme of affliction, Saturn, there's just so many issues around um, this particular solar return. Um, here, there's a lunar return as well, but I would like you to, you know, ignore that for now, because I usually use this chart when I talk about lunar returns, which we're not. But I just want you to, again, notice where the ellipses are. You know, you'll see these, these conjunctions even by sign, right? So, the moon, and Saturn are in the same sign, not super close, I wouldn't necessarily put a lot of weight on it, but be aware of it. Ascendant and Mars are linked, and then of course MC and the Moon are linked as well. Alright, so before I go to my next example, and we have, looks like about 20 minutes, so that's pretty good. Um, are there any questions about what we're doing or how we're doing this? Anyway, there are a couple of questions, uh, but oh, one is just, if you could do a quick summary of the logic of the steps you're following for for this. Mm -hmm. um, that would be helpful, I think, for a number a of A quick people. summary, sure, yeah. absolutely. And so if you go back, and I would refer you back to the slide where I kind of give you the steps um, that I do. Um, so this is nothing that we haven't learned, but I'll just show you what those steps are again. Let me go back, back to this list here. I think it's absorbing how the the Lord of the Year with the perfections, mm -hmm. getting that nailed absolutely. with how, how that fits into everything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So remember, you start with the Lord of the Year's location, right? And you figure out what it's doing in that solar return. Um, I, again, I don't want to, there's a lot of information to take in, but right. if you just start with that, you'd probably get a lot of info. So if we go back. So it's the Lord of the Year is, say, natal chart, how old are you, counting around the chart, and remembering mm -hmm. that we, we actually mark our birthday at the end of a year. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Not one, year exactly. Old. not one year old until That's we've lived for a year. Bingo. Okay. Then whatever the so, sign is yeah, on that so Hold that planet in mind. Exactly. So you think about Jupiter, right? And so you think, okay, so actually before we can go to the solar return, here's just the natal chart we can see, okay, we're having a Jupiter year, so potentially an expansive year of additional opportunities, right? That said, in the natal chart, you know, like in Edgar Degas' case, Jupiter is a little challenged, right? He's in a sign that he doesn't like, um, even though he's in the fifth, so it could be artistically a good or powerful year for him. Um, but again, remember that the fifth, you know, is also in the eighth from the tenth, so you're thinking, okay, maybe if there are already questions about you know, his mom's well-being, that, that could be challenging, all right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully we're, we're all on the same page so far. Okay. So after you deal with the natal chart, then you go to the solar return chart. Exactly, exactly. So then you, you look at Jupiter in the solar return, and you think, okay, there might be challenges. You, and you might be happy to see Jupiter is exalted, but as you can see, it didn't necessarily result in a good outcome in this case, right? But you think, okay, well, it is exalted, but you also look at other things going on with it, right? It is patent, which can mean that even though it's in a strong place, it has a hard time expressing itself. I think that's, that's one particular challenge. The other challenge, and this is something, again, not all of you are familiar with this, and I, I, we don't have time to teach it, but if you have issues, for example, your receptions. So remember how Venus is in the eighth house for him? So, uh, Venus is in a, in, um, in a difficult sign for Jupiter, right? Jupiter is in detriment in, in Virgo, so he doesn't like that sign, but he is now contacting this, this pretty challenging Venus. So, it could be that there is some possibility of expansion here, but at the same time, it is, um, you know, it, it might be linked in some way to something bad going on with the mother. Interestingly, Venus, again, fifth house, remember you know, 8th mm -hmm. from the 10th. So you're starting to see these repetitions. Okay. So, so the other thing I would do, and if you didn't know, yeah, just very quickly, if you didn't know what you're looking thing. for. Yeah. Oh, there's just one just question very quick before we go on. Examining the angles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
so if you're looking at Jupiter, you would also look at its condition as well from other aspects. Do you, how? Yes. So it's got a trine with Saturn that's somewhat wide, or is that too wide for your solar returns? Do you use tight orbs in the solar return? Yeah, you know, I'm happy. Do. I usually use um, a moiety of orbs, so these actually, so based on, you know, each planet has an orb, not aspect, um, that's a little different than what most people are used to. For me, yes, they would be an aspect, and there's some difficulty here too, because Jupiter is in, um, in Cancer, where Saturn is in detriment, so it's mm -hmm. kind of a weird love-hate relationship here, uh, but Saturn is in Jupiter's sign, so this, this is actually, in terms of reception, and again, only a few of you might kind of be following, which is, it's not super essential, but it might be helpful. Saturn is being received by Jupiter. You think of it as Saturn being an honored guest in Jupiter's house, but Jupiter is not getting the same kind of um, respect from Saturn, which means it's almost like you're taking like a thief into your house, unaware. It's that kind of relationship. It's not actually very um, uh, productive, I would say. Okay. So if that had been a square, then you would have like a double hit of not only is it not helpful, but it's... Exactly. Okay. That's exactly right. Okay. And I guess um, in terms of how you're approaching too, it's, there's a question of the style of astrology, and, and this is based mostly on traditional, yes? Mostly, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. There, there still seems to be some confusion out there about the solar return and the Lord of the Year. Um, I, I think it, you need to make it clear that you reach the Lord of the Year only through perfecting the natal chart, not the solar return. That's absolutely true. Without the without using perfections, you do not get a Lord of the Year. Right. So you have when you look at the when you transfer over to the solar return, it sounds as if one of the first things you look at is what's going on with the Lord of the Year more so than the Sun, or the are they equal? I would say that's the number one thing. Okay. And certainly okay. I wouldn't ignore the Sun, and sometimes they're the same. However, I want to make very clear that the Lord of the Year is the first thing you look at, and one of the reasons we have challenges with, I think, how we do solar returns um, popularly right now is that people start with a sun, um, even though it actually may not be particularly significant that year. So once we're there, then we look at that, and then you take a look at, at any other angular planets. It's kind of how you would then work your way through. Exactly. And then I would look at, all right, and is my solar return making close aspects um, to anything in the natal chart? Okay. All right, so hopefully that gives you that overview. Remember, everyone, you will get the recording. And um, are you okay if I print out a handout from your presentation so they can look at the steps that you had up on screen? Yes, of course. Absolutely. Okay. So that you'll be able to review and you'll see that the steps are there. So yeah, <laughs> the and I do recommend that because it's, yeah. there's a lot. Yeah. So the main thing to Absolutely. remember is first natal chart, figure out how old the person is, or you, <laughs> if you're doing it for yourself. Right. Get the Lord of the Year. Then go to the solar return chart. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. The right. Lord, so the, well, there is still one last question in here. The ruler on the ascendant of the solar return. What kind of weight do you give to that? That's a very general question. And because this is a presentation about solar returns, I give it 100% weight. I think the question isn't which is more important, the natal or the solar return. What's more important is what does the solar return act? activate in your natal chart. If it doesn't activate anything in a particular year, which happens pretty frequently actually, if it doesn't activate anything, it's probably not a very eventful or important year on the whole. Does that help? Yes. Good. I think, I think this webinar actually has done one very good thing and that's the idea that sometimes has been presented out there that a solar return is, is you just, you know, you look at, at that, you kind of just 
figure out and and it seems like it's very, very general. And this is giving much more specific details on a logic to follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And that's my goal is that hopefully um, if you go back, if you want to try this, say, on your own chart, and I highly recommend if you're interested in these techniques, you know, pick a year in your life where something interesting happened, right? Something major, good or bad, and then go through and see, okay, what was my what was my perfected year that year? What was the Lord of the year? What was it doing in my solar return? What was my what was being activated in my chart? That's how I developed a lot of these techniques. I worked with my own chart and people I knew because of course I could ask them as well as celebrities. But I like working with people that I know because that way I can get feedback in a way that I can't get from this. Right, and sometimes an, and sometimes an eventful year for a celebrity may not actually be what we think it is because we don't I know so who they are. I agree with that, Ian. <laughs> point. Yeah, exactly. They, they, yeah, their public face may be very different from what's going on in their lives. And one other question before, oh, well, actually, there's some more coming in here. You've got a very active group. Would you calculate a Good, solar... Good, I'm glad. I was worried I put them all to sleep. <laughs> Go ahead. Would you calculate a solar chart for a nation or a business? I don't see why not. It's not traditionally done. But if you're if you have a good chart to start with that you're you know that's reliable and that's timed, which isn't always easy for a nation or a business, but if you do, I don't see why you wouldn't. It does seem like it could be a very useful tool. And here's a, a more a little more philosophical. Would you mind repeating that, Ina? You broke up for a second. Oh, I'm sorry. It it does sound like it would be a very useful, the solar return for. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I, like I said, I do recommend you test this out on, you know, known past events just to see how it works in practice. The the other question is a little bit more philosophical, and it's how you how do you perceive using the solar return? Does it is it something where it says this is something you can evolve into through this year? Is it a layering over a datal return? Do you see it more? manifestation like events in a year or do you also see reflections of personal growth in a solar return? I think there can be both um, and I think that's a great great question. I definitely think it has to do with events as I mentioned early on that's primarily what I'm interested in but I think actually this Edgar Degas example I like it because it has both. Now I think he is unique in that he took this I think very difficult event in his childhood and in some ways whether he was in control of it fully or not, you know, he was 13, I think it actually did really um, develop his art in some powerful ways. And I think this is again my personal theory that I'm not, you know, I'm not prepared to sort of put it out there as any kind of, um, you know, this is what you must do. But I do believe that, for example, the fact that this exalted Jupiter is in charge of, of the year that's in the solar return, I think that does speak to the fact that he could take this bad event, this very traumatic event, and have it de have him develop into um, the artist that he was, um, maybe through it in some way. So I think both are definitely possible. Okay. One other question. Oh, not one other question. There's a number of things, but okay. <laughs> anyway, the other is on timing. If you have a solar oh, return, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. a lot of people will have suggested that you just go house by house for month by month. Do you, do mm -hmm. you use that method as a timing method or do you have another? I don't. I don't. You know, I don't, to be honest, I, I don't spend too much time, and part of the issue is we don't have too much time together but today, but um, what I usually do is if I get interested in, okay, I see something being promised in the chart and I want to know when it happens, I would then do lunar returns for that year and then see if there's a repetition of themes in a particular month. We don't have the time to show how it works, but you can see, you know, previously I showed that triple, um, triple chart earlier, and you would just overlay all three of them and see what gets, whether some of the promises in the solar return that are triggering natal things are, is that getting triggered by a lunar return? So it's a little bit beyond the scope, but that would be the method that, that I'd recommend. Okay. Um, I think some of these questions have all, they're all, a lot of them are variations on, on a similar 
themes. So we are running short of time. Let's give you a chance to wrap up with what you'd like to wrap I up do. with. I do. And I had another example. Yeah. And I don't think, I don't want to necessarily take you into it because we only have a few minutes. So I might skip over it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Unless you'd like to um, look forward. I have, well, I don't know. I don't know. Can we go over a couple of minutes even? We can go over be a terrible. Bit. That won't be terrible. Okay. Again, I, you know, yeah, if people need to drop, they can drop and then can catch up on the recording. So um, so I just wanted to show you a little bit um, the chart of Louisa May Alcott. And here this is in Regio Montanus, but don't worry about that. It's not very important. As, you, as some of you may know, um, she was a 19th century author. She wrote Little Women, which was a huge hit. Um, she was an American writer and uh, at a time when being a female author was highly, highly unusual and, um, you know, it wasn't really encouraged and, in fact, actively discouraged as immoral and just all sorts of bad. Um, but anyway, so here's her chart that I just wanted to kind of acquaint you with, and I'll, I'll show you some of the ways that when Lily, Little Women came out, the way that it manifested for her. So this is a positive event. Um, so Little Women came out in 1868 and 69 because it was in two volumes. And the first volume, which I think is probably the most important one, was published when she was in her 12th house perfected year. Which again, here's the theme that just because you're in your perfected, you know, 8th house year or 12th house year doesn't mean it'll be a terrible year. It all depends on what is going on with the planet that's ruling that house. So if we go back, she's in her 12th house year here. What rules it? It's, it's Leo, right? And what, it, what is the ruling planet? The sun. So it actually could be a year of great solar energy, which of course fame is, is a traditional signification. It's in the third house, associated with writing, natally. So all right, so it could be fame through writing, and she was a writer all her life. She started as, as a little girl. So we are we are already thinking that just because somebody, you know, just because it's a twelfth house year for you doesn't mean it's a year of suffering or it's a terrible year. It really depends on what is going on and what kind of ruling planet is in charge. Here, it's a, it's a very bright and cheery sun in Sagittarius. So you know that it's going to be likely a pretty nice year. I just wanted to make sure that was emphasized. Here's her solar return, and I just wanted to acquaint you with that. So if we're just looking at the solar return, we know that the sun is the lord of the year. And where does it fall? in the ninth house. Now that's cadent, but it's also the house of publishing. So if, like Louisa May Alcott, a publisher approached you, which is what happened to her, and said, hey, could you write me some chapters on spec, which is what she did, you'd probably say yes, because you can see this is, it's kind of in alignment with what your son, your lord of the year, kind of wants to do. Now check this out as well. The next thing that we do is we look at, you know, there aren't big aspects to the sun. As you can see, the closest we have is maybe a conjunction to Mars. Mars, as you can see, is on the MC. So there's some, we can see this is going to be an energetic and intense career year for her. But look at this. We also have Jupiter right on the ascendant. And what's Jupiter about to do? Remember this whole thing with changing signs? Well, Jupiter is changing from Aquarius to Pisces. He has a lot of dignity in Pisces. It's his own sign. So we can see something's about to happen to her that is going to be probably life-changing. And indeed, that's exactly what it was. She got extremely good reviews. She made a lot of money. You know, it was really, she changed from a, a minor writer into a, you know, major national and ultimately historically important uh, of, a, of a role. So just be aware of this. So, you know, again, planets on the angles are very important. So I wanted to show you just comparing her natal and her solar returns. If, if this is small, I apologize, but um, hopefully you'll get the gist. So you can see here that Jupiter is right here. Um, and this is something that's really interesting because she has, um, if this is at 29 uh, Aquarius. She has her natal moon at 22 Aquarius. Now it's in the sixth house, so I think this tells us of, of the toil that she endured. She said, I think, that whole year was just very exhausting for her because she wrote the book in less than a year. Uh, but Jupiter on the moon is favorable, right? It may mean that also even though she worked hard, you know, it didn't impact her health negatively. So be aware of that. Now let us look at what this means for the Lord of the year. So we have in the ninth house here and in the third house here. 
And notice also that Mars and Venus in the solar return at 15 and 23 Sagittarius respectively are contacting her Mercury. Again, you know, Venus on Mercury is not huge, but Mars is important. So there's some activation of third house issues and, for, and well, particularly mercurial issues in this case. This is all about writing. It's a year of great potential for her, all right? So this is what a typical analysis would look like. So it's not necessarily something that you would um, obviously expect to see every year, but just be aware that this is, you know, this is the way that we go into that solar return. Note also that that solar return has Pisces. Notice I'm not using whole signs to show you, but that's how we're really looking at this. It has Pisces on the ascendant. Well, Pisces is her seventh house, so it's all about fame of being out and out in the world, right? Of being recognized. So there are a lot of indications here, especially with that active midheaven with Mars on there and with the Sun only seven degrees away, that there's going to be a lot of recognition and a lot of activity um, that she's going to experience that year, which is exactly what took place for her. All right. So this is not as deep an analysis as what we did with Edgar Degas, Degas but I wanted to show you just kind of, again, you know, it, you'll have to practice this a little bit with a few charts, again, especially ones that you know, I highly recommend it, in order to start seeing these patterns. And the more that you look at it and the more you contemplate them, the better your results, I think, are going to be because you can take those learnings and observations into your work with your clients or predicting for yourself. All right, so I think that's all I have. Um, so if there are any questions or um, issues that even you might run into later, feel free to email me at any time.